Some films were harmed in the making of this podcast. Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and the Glacial FYC Studios, considering the weather we've had down here lately. <laughs> You're listening to For Your Consideration, the podcast featuring roundtable discussion, reevaluating the cinematic canon of past masterpieces and modern classics. I'm your host, Mike Josek. And I'm Dustin Friesman. And hello to all our listeners who are catching the show on YouTube, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Google Play, and wherever great pods are cast. If this isn't your first time listening to the show, welcome back and thanks for joining us. And if this is your first time, Be warned, spoilers ahead. Also, I'm sorry in advance. And also, if you're listening to the show on iTunes, we encourage you to rate and review the show while you're there. It helps put the show in the podcast standings and gets the word out, which is always a good thing. So welcome, welcome to the show. This is actually, we're kind of calling an audible on this one. Originally, we were going to do an episode with a guest commentator who you'll see next week. Uh, It's Billy Seaguire. He uh, does a podcast called Film Runners, as well as a podcast called Scooby-Doo's or Scooby-Don'ts. And we were covering the film Cairo, also known as Pulse, Japanese horror movie. But while editing our last episode are all things considered with the Ready Player One review, I realized, oh, it's the 50th anniversary of 2001 A Space Odyssey. Oopsie. (laughs) And this is a movie Dustin's been wanting to do since literally the first day we started doing the podcast. Plus, it's a super highly ranked film, and it's the 50th anniversary. You're not going to hit another good anniversary like that. I know, and we were kind of like, we just did a Kubrick movie, like, what, three weeks ago or something? (laughs) Doesn't matter. But it doesn't matter. This is 50 years. This is a movie that everybody talks about. It's been in, it's influenced everybody, so it's just, it's just a good time to talk about this movie. Sorry, Billy. Everybody's heard about 2001 A Space Odyssey, a.k.a. that film that you're all born knowing the plot to, somehow. So yeah, let's roll the credits on 2001, and then we will get into our discussion. So 2001 was directed by Stanley Kubrick, produced by Stanley Kubrick, and the screenplay was by Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke. It starred Keir DeLea, Gary Lockwood. Uh, Cinematography was by Jeffrey Unsworth. It was edited by Ray Lovejoy. It was distributed by MGM, and it was given a wide release in the U.S. on April 3rd, 1968. The National Board of Review lists 2001 among the top 10 films of 1968. The film is number 6 on the 50 Films to See Before You Die list. The Village Voice 100 Best Films of the 20th Century brings it in at number 11. And Roger Ebert's Top 10 Films of All Time has it at number 2. In 1995, the Vatican actually named it as one of the 45 best films ever made. And the American Film Institute's 100 Years 100 Movies has it at number 15 on its list of the 100 best films of all time. Whereas on Sight and Sound, it is number 2 on the director's poll and number 6 on the critics' poll, marking it as the highest rated film we've ever done. I was really surprised when I saw that 6th and 2nd place. I was like, what? (laughs) (laughs) I was a little surprised to hear you say the Vatican named it. I didn't know they had lists. (laughs) I didn't either. I was just, we pick, you know... We've got our AFI, BFI, and Sight and Sound that we check all the time, and then I always scan quickly sort of uh, the accolades or whatever on Wikipedia, and there's the Vatican. So take that, CFI. A little trivia bit. For, yeah, they're, they're, we don't have a Canadian Film Institute. <laughs> How about DFI? <laughs> what is that? Darfur? <laughs> <laughs> we have the National Film Board. Who said it was Canada? Could be Columbia. This is true. This is true. Catman? No, Catman dudes with a K. <laughs> that's also a mountain no it's not i didn't get much sleep last night that's my excuse all of a sudden <laughs> don't worry mike's editing this out so with that out of the way let's move on to the discussion dustin uh i believe you've seen 2001 previous to this i did and i was looking forward to seeing it again with more educated eyes because believe it or not despite what absolutely no one is telling me i'm not perfect and you've wanted to do this film as i said in the intro since day one, I remember you dropping like, hey, we should do 2001. <laughs> and I did not enjoy it the first time. So now, here you are, 
Seeing it again. Older, what? wiser, presumably knowing better what I'm talking about. What did you think of this film? I thought I was not entirely accurate the first time I saw it. When right. I first saw it, I thought of it as three films effectively, with only one of them that was even of any sort of value whatsoever, which would be the center story with uh, Hal and the expedition off to Jupiter. The whole part at the beginning with the... Dawn of Man. Dawn of Man, the Australopithecus learning that, hey, I can use this bone to beat the shit out of some Neanderthals and get this grimy watering hole all to myself. I was like, who cares? And then the 15-minute segment at the end with here's a bunch of colors and a star baby. I was like, this is this is just stupid. And the center part was a mediocre film. Now I see it as one solid film that's entirely mediocre. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many excellent shots in this film. There are some beautiful things that is that are done with the camera, with the sets, with all of the rotating rooms that they have, with just the close-ups on Hal. Hal shows so much emotion for just being a red light. He shows more emotion than basically every other actor in this film. Would you agree with that, David? <laughs> I do. And that is actually, that was intentional. Kubrick actually instructed Gary Lockwood and Kira Delea to totally underplay their part and to uh, be almost mechanical. Well, it shows in the fact that there is effectively garbage acting other than how. <laughs> and these guys, these astronauts have been on this voyage for a long time. They're not, you know, you're not seeing all the, oh, this is amazing. And, oh, wow, we've never seen this before because this is. Or the, oh, my God, you're floating through space. Or the, this no, is, he's dead. <laughs> this is months into their journey. They're familiar with Hal. They have a relationship with Hal. They have their daily routine. They go jogging. They're drawing. They're eating. They're watching the news. It's imagine a road trip with no stops and no sightseeing for several months and hey that's all fine and dandy it's the fact that there's no emotional reaction to the deaths of anyone else on that crew there's no concern when he's flying through space there's you know what happened there must have been an accident and like nobody nobody cares <laughs> <laughs> Even at the beginning of the flight, though, it's that's where you'll get most of your your emotion. It's pretty pretty played down. I actually did like his kid. His kid was definitely a kid. It felt very much like talking to a kid, just squirming, responding like an idiot. It was it was pretty good. <laughs> I actually I wanted to check like the the credits and cast listing or whatever. I have a strange suspicion that this kid might be related to Kubrick. <laughs> <laughs> there was. There was a physical resemblance. I feel that there's a familial connection there. And it would make sense to, to have her in the movie for that reason. But there's a naturalness to this movie. I mean, from the very outset, Kubrick wanted to make this movie as realistic as possible. Which so, is why all of our food comes at first in cube form that you drink with straws. Because that's how it's going to work in the future. Until it's not when it's sandwiches or weird peel-away cans where it's all a paste. There's three different kinds of food. I don't know why. In space. <laughs> do you have rations? Do you have sandwiches? What food do you have? Because you're showing me three different things here. <laughs> and none of them jive with each other. When I first saw this movie, I was very young. I'm not sure what age exactly. But I just remember it being hypnotic. I remember anytime this movie was on, uh, PBS actually played it quite a bit. And... I'd just be flipping through channels and I would see... I wouldn't even necessarily watch this movie from beginning to end. It was just wherever it was, it just caught me and I would watch it. I found it incredibly engaging, incredibly baffling. And, you know, to this day, I was watching it and I'm thinking, God damn it, how did they do that effect? <laughs> there are some spectacular effects. Even just the monkeys screaming at the beginning, Australopithecus, like... That was well done. That was some good acting, actually, by the people in the monkey suits. And I did a little bit of research, and I found out how some of it was done. I remember watching a, a documentary, again, years ago, like 30 years ago. They were saying, and I don't know if this is apocryphal or if this is genuine, but the person in the documentary was saying that the special effects on 2001 were kept like a secret. And they didn't reveal, you know, Doug Trumbull didn't tell anybody how they did the weightlessness and uh, little things like that. I mean, everybody knew the spaceships were models, but um, the weightlessness was like the big thing that they didn't want to reveal. 
That was impressive. I was looking for strings. It didn't. It didn't look like strings. May or may not be true, but like I said, I wondered about this stuff for ages. And yeah, that weightlessness. Some of that weightlessness does look like the uh, what do they call it? The vomit rocket. Yeah, with the airplane that will uh, for thirty dive, seconds. 30 yeah. seconds. I mean, it looks real, and ultimately, it was done with with cables. Uh, the scene where Ger- um, Kier Delea playing Dave Bowman, he blows himself out of the pod into the airlock of he the Discovery. bounces off that wall pretty hard. Apparently, that was a vertical set, and they opened the pod, and they dropped the actor on a cable so that he would fall all the way down to the floor and hit the floor. And he hits the floor with his head, too. I don't know if you saw that. <laughs> And then the cable pulls him back up, and he's supposed to grab that emergency handle. And he, he pulls it off, to his credit. <laughs> he does, and I think he had to do it a couple of times. But when you're watching it, I mean, it looks so genuine. I mean, obviously, it's a it's an interesting technical achievement. Just, you know, having smoke and mirrors, essentially. You know, the set is built a certain way. The camera's positioned a certain way. They did the same thing with, like, the rotation of things. But one thing that just boggled me beyond comprehension was the floating pen on the shuttle bus that was taking Haywood to the um, the space station. <laughs> I was watching one of the documentaries on the DVD, and apparently they had a pen affixed to a pane of glass that was held in front of the camera, and they would tilt the glass <laughs> to give the illusion of the pen floating, and then the actor playing the space stewardess would walk up to it pick it off the glass, and put it in Floyd's pocket. And that just blew my mind. And I love the fact that this movie, 50 years later, is still blowing my mind with some of the simplest but most effectively performed special effects. But that's, funny enough, one of my primary issues with this film. It feels like it's one giant tech demo. You do long shots, and they are long shots, of... Just, here's the stewardess walking into this room, and now walking up, so she's upside down, and walking into this other room now. (laughs) And they're not holding back. They're going to give you 20 minutes of pure silence as they just show how this spaceship runs. It's not going to astound nowadays. You're going to see a lot of weird buttons that are like, this is definitely what people in the late 60s thought that computers were going to be like in 30 years because this takes place in 1998 is when the first HAL or when this HAL came out 1999 something like that so yeah it is 2001 that is when this film is taking place (laughs) I believe they started developing the movie in uh, 66 so Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke were projecting 35 years in the future and their computers still look very 60s well no yeah 35 2001 and you have your good old video calls and phones and whatnot. And I don't expect them to get everything right, but... Bear in mind, at when that most time... most of the film is like this kind of tech demo, that's what you're showing. That's what's living on 40 years down the line. <laughs> at that time, the space race was in full swing. So I'm pretty sure that they were looking at the way things were developing with NASA and in the space program and figured, at this rate... In 35 years, we probably will have space stations in space, yada, yada, yada. Until they decided that they're going to cut all funding to NASA and just start throwing it at tanks that we're going to throw into the ocean because we don't need them ever. So, yeah. And I mean, we, we see a lot of old movies that have old tech and... I'm okay with that as long as it's sort of consistent and... I'm, I'm fully okay with old tech and film. The problem with it in this one is that that's what they're showing. That's all they're showing in a lot of these shots. The whole story of the film, and you say that movies are too long all the time, I'm going to say this movie is two hours could have been cut pretty much. <laughs> and you'd have the full story because of the sheer amount of long sweeping shots. And in some in some cases, it's actually setting a very a very good mood and tone. And I could see the requirement of having these other long shots because otherwise, tonally, you can't have this long shot here and then everything else be nicely tightly edited. So it keeps a very consistent. Everything is super slow throughout the entire film. But you've got two hours of nothing happening. Before 2001, science fiction was all B-movies. It was gorilla suits with space helmets. It was giant ants. It was, uh, you know, 
Buster Crab in his tight tights, <laughs> punching guys in uh, you know cardboard <laughs> suits of armor, and spaceships flying around on wires with the smoke coming out the back. And it was all very you know whoosh zoom bang. And this was a very serious meditation and and technical exercise treating science fiction as a serious genre and people hadn't seen anything like this up to this point nobody had tried to make a science fiction this movie legitimized science fiction i mean it's it's essentially it's like a symphony or an opera or or something with like four movements it even has an intermission (laughs) it does have an intermission and and i think i think that's why i'm okay with it because yeah there's probably a half an hour without dialogue (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and the moon part is very brief, to be perfectly honest. And it's an hour before you get to the discovery. And, and it's them setting up that somebody's going to the discovery and there's a discovery that's happened. And this but is, nobody knows what it is. This <laughs> is an hour and a half from the point where we join the discovery. And when you think about it, an hour and a half is the length of a feature. <laughs> so, yeah, there's an hour that runs kind of long and and could be viewed as extraneous, but I'm with Kubrick on this. I'm actually and we had the same experience with Full Metal Jacket where you were kind of like there's two very distinct parts to this movie. There's the boot camp and there's the the actual in-country stuff. And nobody remembers that there's the in-country stuff, which I neglected to mention last time. Nobody even remembers that there was an in-country stuff. So is it that memorable? Was it that impactful if nobody even remembers anything but the boot camp and the sergeant shouting at people? But carrying on to 2001, like we should. <laughs> well, I, I think it's fair to, to also kind of compare some of our thoughts on Full Metal Jacket because the filmmaker is still the same. And Kubrick's techniques, his way of telling stories, this is his particular idiom. This is, he likes long sustained shots he likes really taking the time to not only get it right but get it perfect to really let the audience see what is being done that's one of the things that i like about the length of some of these scenes like when the ship lands on the moon and it does that slow you know descent on that platform and you see all the little control rooms in this vast cavernous sort of hangar and you've got the blue danube playing not only is it kind of sweeping and elegant and you know they could have gone with you could totally rescore this movie with like weird clint mansell kind of sci-fi moody stuff and it would probably also play really well but i think the use of that classical music i mean there's this undercurrent in this movie of technology violence I think that classical music is a counterpoint to that. So when you're seeing this technology, when you're seeing... It's twofold. You're seeing the beauty of space, the vastness of space, uh, the the balletic movement of these ships through this vast cosmic void but then there's also you know like that nuclear satellite platform that the bone turns into you've got like one weapon to the other weapon which has been talked about so much and you introduce you've got that famous you know da 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 and then it goes into the spec zarathustra okay yeah and then it uh, and then it goes into blue danube which is a waltz and it's beautiful but yeah just to, to move on to my original point there like in that scene you see everything and, and so much of special effects and considering when this movie was also made where they were really struggling to get this stuff to do the things that they were supposed to do. They didn't have computers. They didn't have, you know, the the techniques that we use in the last 20, 30 years. And so much of special effects even nowadays are quick cuts and what you don't see and they just have to show you okay if it's this specific angle for five seconds then we're good we'll edit it in it'll look great and this lingers and it's lit because he wants you to see it (laughs) and i i appreciate that it's one of the things that i actually really like about this movie you mentioned the classical music and that's one thing that actually i had a problem with (laughs) because nowadays classical music the the impression that i sort of get from it is that it's supposed to be high class and it seems like it's almost getting its head up its own ass to an extent when you're showing any time the planets align is when they'll play also Sprach Zarathustra and it's supposed to create that awe of everything that's going on (laughs) (laughs) but you have yeah a waltz playing and it just but you can see how the... It's what I associate with those songs now. You can see which how says the shuttle just, moving it, into the, the space station, how the Blue Danube, how a waltz is appropriate for that. 
Or maybe you can't. <laughs> I can. And there's a there's an interesting juxtaposition to an extent. But once again, I'm seeing this as a tech demo. And having classical music on a tech demo makes it seem more like a tech demo than a film. <laughs> I will give you that watching it this time, it's probably been a good 10 or 20 years since I've seen this movie. And watching it this time, I didn't love the classical music as much as I used to. I used to think it was just perfection and now it was a little conspicuous and especially when there's pure silence in a lot of other scenes which i think fits with space because there's no sound in space right but i think the fact that my opinion has changed says more about me than it does about the film and i don't hate the music being there it just stands out a little bit more now it doesn't blend as perfectly as it did when i watched it in my younger years one thing that I got to say about the music is that with the cultural zeitgeist that this movie is, everybody knows the plot of this film, regardless of whether they've seen it. When I see or hear any of these songs from the film, it's 2001 I think of. <laughs> you cannot deny the influence that it's had. It's completely co-opted the music that's been used in it. It is very conspicuous music. <laughs> you mentioned the silent bits, and I kind of wanted to touch on that. I mean, this actually addresses the long protracted scenes with no dialogue as well as kind of the silent bits and i think it's an achievement that this this was essentially a sound era silent film <laughs> i mean there's <laughs> the dialogue in this is so sparse and so much of it is told with sound not not even just music but sound as well and you know those scenes where they're in the suits and you can hear the breathing like the breathing almost serves as an underscore to the scene because the character's aren't speaking and there isn't a lot of you know mechanical like when the pod when the pod goes open the pod bay doors hal and he won't and he brings the pod up and he grabs it with the arm and he's turning the thing there isn't like a mechanical you know kind of noise right it's just we're in space there's no sound and that works it works perfectly well i appreciate sci-fi that does that for sure and i think for me it's, incre it's an achievement. It's incredibly uh, progressive as well as retroactive, I think, to, to make a movie that is essentially a sound era silent film. Even if they use the music almost inconsistently, half the time you have pure silence, half the time it's a random classical song. <laughs> what did you think about the music? Or the one time that they, the few times that they do have something that is scored where it sounds like somebody is just drunk walking through an orchestral pit and just keeps bumping into the drum case. <laughs> After the whole thing where he's flowing through space, and it's 15 minutes, people. Two minutes of it is him flying up to the monolith, which is now in space all of a sudden, and then 13 minutes... Oh, you're talking about the Stargate? Yeah, 13 minutes. I timed it. 13 minutes of random colors, just color-filtered yeah. aerial shots of deserts, and every now and then a close-up on his eye... And the sound, especially after that, once he's finally in the in the fancy hotel room that's outside of time and space, it just sounds like somebody left the recording on while somebody's walking through the orchestral pit and he's a little drunk and just bumping into stuff. <laughs> that's all I could see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was just about to ask you what you thought of the music that was used every time the monolith was around, which you kind of just addressed. It was a lot of that overlaid choral stuff. All the chanting. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was cool. I liked it. I think it, it created an alienness to it, and it was ominous and dramatic and a little tense. Very different from the classical scores. Like, you have three completely different and distinctive soundtracks. And this movie did have an actual score that was composed by Alex North, uh, who didn't know his score was omitted until he saw the movie on its premiere. <laughs> <laughs> Which is classic Kubrick. Classic. But Fuck those guys working for me. I'm <laughs> Kubrick. I'd be super curious to actually track down uh, Alex North's score. I don't know if it's ever been issued uh, officially and to watch the movie, you know, with his music. I wonder, maybe there's a, a fan in it or something that's that's put it in there. But let's talk about let's talk about the Stargate. You brought up the Stargate. Yes, the first 20 minutes of the movie has no dialogue and the last 20 minutes of the movie have no dialogue. <laughs> I got no problem with no dialogue. But <laughs> what, what was your... It's a very... It's a much interpreted ending i'm curious what you took out of it my interpretation of the monolith from what i see is also the one that's 
been hit over my head for however many years in video games or anything that sort of co-opted the monolith, it is advancement. When the monolith appears by Australopithecus at first, they all of a sudden realize, oh shit, tools. Tools are something I could use. And they use it and they realize I can crush friggin' skulls with this nonsense. And so it's an instant advancement. It's here you've gained a couple levels. It's a cheat code. Level 9,000! <laughs> A cheat code for technical advancement. And the first scenes, it shows the early man, and they're they're scared. They're huddling. They're just trying to survive. I don't know why they ran away from the other guys, since nobody actually bothered fighting. Running away from the tiger made perfect goddamn sense, however. I love how when they actually start using the tools, the next couple of scenes are them just like, they all have meat. They're all eating. Well, they they showed those uh, sort of pig-like things just falling over as soon as he was swinging it a whole lot. All of a sudden, just a few animals fall over. They're like, fuck, these guys that have been hanging out around us and just being annoying, I can just club them over the head. (laughs) (laughs) So presumably the monolith just fucks off for a while. Mankind evolves as it's going to. It ends up on Io somehow for some reason. And speaking of that, plot-wise, there's something that confused me. They're on Io. They discover the monolith. Something happens, and it says 18 months later. Oh, and that's no, when... dude, that was the moon. That was the Tycho Crater on the moon. That's Earth's moon. Oh, so the monolith was in Tycho Crater and then went to Io? Monolith was on Earth. Monolith was on the moon. It's following our progress. And then monolith out in Jupiter. It's it's our progression as we're moving out. All right. All right. My apologies for that. Yeah, it wasn't 18 months to get from Io to... <laughs> No, I thought it was like they were talking about how it was the first time they ever made it out to Io. And like, you were just there. That's where the monolith is, isn't it? Like, that's that's what we were just talking about. Because weren't you all standing around taking a picture of the monolith? But yeah, so ignoring all of that, nothing happens with the monolith the second time. It basically messes up some guys in Tycho Crater. And they know that it exists, presumably, and what they're scanning for. And they notice something out on Io. They send everyone out there keep everything nice and secret and this time the monolith the stars align zarathustra plays again and because the stars aligned it activates thus shooting him forward technologically there's your stargate scene and it moves him beyond time and space effectively and he's just sitting around there aging and living in this little hotel room outside of time until he's about to die and it appears before him again thus propelling him a second time And I feel that that second propelling was unnecessary. You propelled him once to show us just scenes of him outside of time and space, then to become the star child as though we need two jumps to get there. And that's pretty much all it's showing. Well, and the star child just being, okay, this is that much further advanced. We don't necessarily know what it means. It's just, we're going to keep going. And here's Earth also. (laughs) You do have a point. He goes, okay, well, the first monolith... Starts us on our technological advancement. The second monolith sends us to Jupiter. And the third monolith... Sends us to... How does it send us to Jupiter? All it did was they tried to take a picture of it and everyone started screaming. They're not clear about it, but the second monolith, it does... I mean, each monolith takes us further. So something happens with the second monolith. Everybody's ears go like, ah. It probably gave somebody like an idea or vision of where to look or something or it was the scanning anomaly that they were able to see on jupiter and they're like shit we found that over here let's go look because they actually had a target a goal in mind so it pushes us farther we go to jupiter we get to jupiter and there's this monolith floating in space the monolith becomes a stargate which takes our protagonist dave bowman into itself and he like you said gets transported outside time and space this hotel room something that is possibly remembered from his memory Kier Delea has often said in speaking engagements that he always envisioned it as this extraterrestrial sentience took a familiar image from his mind this is basically his cage if you're in a zoo and you've got a polar bear you make a pond you put some environmental things around to make it feel kind of at home I mean I don't know why he's there I don't know if he's being observed or if this is just sort of they're waiting or this is the final stage or something but that fourth monolith appears to him after this series of advanced aging and it turns him into the star child it takes him to sort of the next level of human evolution where he becomes another being I believe the original 
concept was that he would come back to Earth and the Star Child would eliminate all nuclear weapons and stuff, things that we were threatening ourselves with. But Kubrick didn't want to make ties to Doctor Strangelove, which he had made previous to this. And it's like, oh, here's another nuclear threat movie. And I think he also liked just leaving it vague. So... I'm cool with the use of the monoliths and I'm, I'm cool with the, the progression of human evolution and the creation of the star child. I like the fact that, that it does provoke interpretation and thought. And I mean, people have argued about this for years. And honestly, this is the first time where I've come away from this movie and actually had what I think is like an actual coherent concept of what happens at the end of the film. <laughs> and, you know, I've been watching this movie since I was probably eight years old. <laughs> so... It would make for a good Twilight Zone episode for sure on top of a two-hour tech demo. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, the monolith, I'd say, is the most interesting part of the film. And I do agree with you. I do agree with you that like the Technicolor landscapes and stuff, it does go on a little long. 13 solid minutes. I mean, it's interesting to have, you know, the weird slit screen stuff, the... The diamonds that appear at one point. Colors and the tetrahedrons and the whatever... I think he does overuse those tinted mesas and stuff. There's a certain point where you can go, oh, this might be like alien landscapes that he's witnessing as he's going through the Stargate. But after a while, it just it's like, oh, okay, here's a green one. Here's a yellow one. Here's an orange one. No, it's purple. Is that the <laughs> same one? I'm, I'm sure that's the same one. Uh, talking about the Stargate kind of jumped ahead a little bit. I forgot I wanted to talk. About Hal. About Hal. IBM. The star that actually Arthur C. Clarke spent decades trying to disabuse people of that, and he said it didn't work. <laughs> people liked it too much. Yeah, IBM liked it too much. Coincidence, and, everyone. And he finally was like, you know what? Screw it. We're rewriting history right here, right now. It's not worth it. It's it's IBM. It's Hal. Who cares? <laughs> uh, we talked a little bit before we recorded about Hal's existential crisis. Ultimately, um, I love it. I I have some added context to it after watching 2010, the year we make contact, which blew my mind in 1984 when they reveal sort of Hal's glitch. But you went into this just seeing, just reading Hal kind of at face value. Uh, what was your take? How did you feel about that? It seems super out of place. They go on and on about how the 9000 series is infallible. And they're moving out to this to the place where they find the monolith. There, you know that there's a glitch, and he makes one mistake, and everything just seems to go to hell from there. And I'm like, why would any of this ever have happened? It's my same issue with the movie Sunshine. Why is it that all of a sudden they start worshiping the sun and think that if you stand in the radiation, you become a superhuman? It's like this. This doesn't fit with the world that you've created for me. But don't you think the threat of them shutting him down is? That could even remotely like a good enough reason for Hal to start freaking out. Absolutely. It could be. Except why are you guys instantly saying, oh, my God, it made a single mistake. We better dismantle the whole thing, because even though humans are prone to error and now this has become theoretically slightly human, we can't trust it with everything anymore. We can't even just say, well, there was one error. Maybe something's going on out here. Let's just double check our stuff. Instead of just saying that, and let's keep this machine, which does a whole hell of a lot for us, they immediately freak out and say, nope, got to shut down the whole thing. We're in charge of everything now. Screw this. Well, okay, again. I thought their reaction was the most insane. I agree. I agree. And I think it is supposed to play that way because they do come across as a little cold and a little mechanical. And Hal's the one who sort of has the soul. (laughs) And they're also (laughs) super suspicious. Oh, yes. So you've never made any mistakes. No 9000 series ever have. So there's a problem in this ship over here. Do you want to come with me, buddy? But I think that's part (laughs) of the hubris of humanity. I think that's part of this machine that we created and we're losing faith in this machine because it's supposed to be infallible and then it's fallible. If it's not perfect, destroy it. That's very Kubrickian. And they also... (laughs) (laughs) Get him out of my film! (laughs) Uh, I also think that, I mean, they weren't talking about shutting Hal down, like, we must destroy him, we must burn him, like, let's delete everything. They were just like, let's shut him down, because it might jeopardize this mission. As and opposed to you two being in charge of everything, doing all the calculations. I'm just, just saying. Just double check it. <laughs> I'm just saying. 
And on top of that, yeah, they definitely. One thing I definitely noticed is he needs to move his seat in. He needs a headrest. Hal, could you move this nineteen degrees up? Sure thing, Dave. Hal, could you could you slide me in just just a bit more? Sure thing, Dave. Hal, could you could could you spoon feed was... me and masturbate me? <laughs> sure thing, Dave. <laughs> The uh, the pedantic asshole in me wants to point out that was Frank, <laughs> not Dave. Um, okay, so something I noticed while watching this movie that I had no recollection of, and I've seen this movie several times. After Dave is shutting Hal down, which I think is one of the most beautiful moments in cinema. That was a fantastic scene until it went on three or four minutes too long as he's closing down all the memory banks. And I also want to point out, when he starts singing Daisy... I was doing some watching of like documentary stuff on the uh, DVD that I have. Watch the two disc collector's DVD that came out. Maybe it was in 2001. I don't know. But uh, when they first started developing computer speech, they felt, uh, I think they said they felt that singing, we would be able to connect to it better. So the first computer articulated computer voice was a computer singing Daisy. Daisy. So I love the fact that they incorporated that. That was like a little Arthur C. Clarke touch. It was probably the most poignant scene of the whole film. Though, as I said before, uh, like when Hal says, I'm scared, Dave, it continues on for another couple of minutes before he repeats himself. He repeats himself a couple of times. I just think they could have really tightened that down and had him go to singing Daisy much sooner. Kept the poignant. It, it's like uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's death in Titanic. Just fucking die already. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, The point of bringing up this scene, uh, the thing that I never remembered was after Hal gets shut down, that video gets activated. And it's obviously a video that was supposed to be given to the astronauts once everybody was awakened because the guy says, you're within Jupiter space and everybody is up, so now we can tell you the real purpose of this mission. And it's the reason that Hal was lying. It's the reason why Hal was a little twitchy. I don't remember that clip being there, and he tells... Dave what the mission was and that's why Dave hops in the pod and goes flying out to the monolith and going through the Stargate which completes the film but it's a good thing that shutting down all the memory and logic cores of Hal somehow activated this tape yeah I don't know how or why (laughs) it activated the tape but it did and it just happened to be at the right time and moment (laughs) space it might have just activated automatically because they were in Jupiter space that's what I honestly would have figured which makes the timing just Deus Ex. Yeah, I'll give you that. (laughs) I'll give you that. Uh, Is there anything else you want to talk about in this movie? I mean, I'm sure I can talk in circles about things, but... (laughs) We could all talk in circles about things, but uh, the explanation of how that comes in 2010 cannot be really included, except for what you see here. And what you see here is Hal makes a mistake, Hal gets paranoid and freaks out and kills everyone. And I think that a lot of the behaviors of the people were just really ridiculous. And Hal did overreact. Everyone just overreacted and acted in really strange ways. Panic! Much <laughs> much like Sunshine, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> the only difference is that when I watch Sunshine now, I think those are a lot of beautiful shots. With 2001, I think there are a lot of beautiful shots, but really anachronistic technology <laughs> that isn't going to live up. Which is why Sunshine probably isn't going to live up either. Who knows? Who knows? Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. What are you talking about, Hal? This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. And I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. Where the hell did you get that idea, Hal? Dave, although you took very thorough precautions in the pod against my hearing you, I could see your lips move. All right, Hal. I'll go in through the emergency airlock. Without your space helmet, Dave, you're going to find that rather difficult. Hal, I won't argue with you anymore. Open the doors. Dave, this conversation can serve no purpose anymore. Goodbye. 
but on to the Masterpiece Museum piece segment of the show. And yeah, I, f- I feel that I don't know what... I can understand how this film was groundbreaking. So many of the shots, so many of the special effects, the tone compared to other movies of the time, and the effect that it's had on the culture, like, it's it's immense. I cannot deny that. And honestly, I wanted to... I was coming in to watching the film this morning thinking, you know, I don't like this film, but just the effect that it's had on culture, I have to go masterpiece. And then I saw the film and I'm like, no, this is... <laughs> This is two hours too long. This is a tech demo. It's a glorified tech demo and a Twilight Zone episode mashed together. It had a huge influence, and it belongs in a museum. (laughs) This is a museum piece. I'm going to agree to disagree with you. (laughs) I, I stand by... I went in thinking that it was going to be a masterpiece. I stand by my initial gut reaction after watching the film. I think this film is just a filmmaking tour de force. I think it is one of the most thought-provoking films ever made. I think on a technical level, it still stands up 50 years later as possibly one of the better films ever made. I mean, I learned last night that all of those African veldt scenes where the ape men are doing their things, that was all shot in studios at Pinewood with front-projected plates of still photographs and I was like, what? <laughs> that is impressive because it does not look like that. <laughs> it blew my mind because I thought this stuff was all shot on location. But Stanley Kubrick doesn't fly. And he only travels abroad if he's on boats. And that was impractical. So he sent a second unit to go shoot plates. He take photographs. And uh, he had this weird system of, of getting them to get the shots that he wanted. And then he just front projected that in a studio and shot his crazy movie with these ape guys. Anyways, <laughs> this is a masterpiece. I, I can't not say it's a masterpiece. It is hypnotic. It is engaging. It's one of the most compelling, long, boring films I've ever seen. <laughs> and I agree with the second two words you used there. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that's that's my position, so... Another split decision on 2001 A Space Odyssey. And this time, most everyone in the world agrees with Mike. But what the question is, what do you guys think? Who do you agree with? Let us know on our YouTube comment threads, on our Facebook page, on our Instagram, on our Twitter. Give us a shout. Tell us what you think. You should also check out our WordPress blog. Uh, We just recently posted a short little essay written by Dustin, which just happens to be about AI. (laughs) (laughs) Even though as I was editing it, I was like, wait, what? Why are we talking about Voyager? And, and, you know, you don't actually reference any films in it. (laughs) I don't. I wasn't talking about films. I was talking about AI. (laughs) It's just a rant on AI. But it's like super appropriate right now because here we have this film that we didn't plan on doing but is here, and it has an AI in it. One of the most famous AIs in cinema history. I thought it was actually more appropriate uh, when we happened to do uh, Ready Player One. (laughs) Oh, I guess. I guess that kind of fits, too. If you want to support the show, uh, like, support, follow, share across the board on all our social media platforms. And you can also hit our Patreon, where we've got some reward levels. If you want to go that extra mile, throw us a little financial support that way. Helps keep the lights on and helps us develop the show and do some interesting things. Throw us a bone, as opposed to crack us over the skull with it. Hey. (laughs) Actually, that reminds me. I wonder how often the people smashing those bones cranked a bone right up into their own face. (laughs) They were flying everywhere, man. (laughs) They were, they were. And I'm actually debating, because 2010 is such a perfect companion, I think, to this movie. And I'm kind of curious, since it's a little bit more straightforward in its storytelling, I just might recommend that to you for our next All Things Considered episode to see what you think of the sequel because you've never seen it it is true i wasn't even really aware that it existed <laughs> <laughs> i might have been 10 years ago but <laughs> and for next week uh we're going to be doing cairo as we said in the introduction also known as pulse japanese film one of the big j horror films from 2001 i believe does that sound right to you actually that's hilarious <laughs> <laughs> considering uh and that's going to feature guest host billy seaguire who is of the film runners podcast and scooby Scooby doos and scooby don'ts so that's it for us this week thanks so much for joining us apologies for the audible but i don't think anybody will really care had a great time talking about this movie and looking forward to seeing you guys on the next episode of for your consideration until next time i've been your host dustin friesenan and i'm mike 
Take care. It just occurred to me I wanted to say, Dustin, what are you doing, Dustin? <laughs> I'm stopping this podcast, Mike. <laughs>